Good morning, everybody. I'm Bob Earl. I'll be the moderator for today's discussion. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself very briefly so you know why I'm the moderator. I'm, I'm going to moderate another panel later in the day focused on fiction. That's how I'm presented in the uh, festival's uh, materials. But in addition to being a fiction writer, uh, I was in the Foreign Service for 25 years. My last three posts uh, were counselor to the Deputy Secretary of State, counselor to the Director of National Intelligence, and senior advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to Iraq. Many other assignments uh, in those 25 years. But that's why uh, I'm your moderator and why I've taken such uh, pleasure in preparing for this event. I want to say a few things on behalf of the festival uh, at first, which is, is just to note that uh, the, the festival, uh, the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, uh, private donors have made uh, these events possible. And uh, if you would like to make a donation, just go on the website and you'll find instructions that will help you do that, and they, that would be most, most welcome. Um, this is the festival's 19th year. The city is alive with discussion. It's an extraordinary uh, credit to Charlottesville and to Virginia that this festival uh, takes place. I uh, particularly uh, want to uh, acknowledge Susan Coleman, who's worked on this event, and my good friend Nancy Damon, who's the director of the uh, festival. Um, a couple uh, administrative points. Uh, I'm going to leave this on. Uh, you have to turn yours off. I'm just, this, is, this doesn't, I've turned the sound off. But I'm going to use it as a stopwatch so I can kind of monitor how we're doing with time. Um, after the program, the festival staff sincerely appreciates it if you would fill out this uh, yellow form evaluating. There's a, is that a phone? Uh, evaluating this discussion. What we're going to do uh, is ask our uh, authors uh, to speak for five to ten minutes, introducing themselves, uh, the <clears throat> books they've written, uh, what brought them to write the books, uh, things that you ought to you know, know about them. And after we go through that in reverse alphabetical order, uh, we're going to have back and forth, and I'm going to encourage you to ask questions and if you don't ask questions, I'll help you. Uh, <laughs> and I, I just wanted to give a quick overview of why this is such a terrific event today. The President of the United States just visited Israel for the first time as president. Uh, he just pushed again for the two-state solution uh, and negotiations uh, between the, uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis. He's, have, he's meeting with the King of Jordan at the moment. That's relevant, as you'll uh, quickly uh, hear from Miko Peled. We've got a civil war in Syria. 60, 70,000 people have died over a two-year period. We've got continuing uh, unrest and divisiveness and violence uh, in Iraq. The President of the United States has just said that the Iranians will not obtain nuclear weapons. The United States will make sure of that. This is something worth uh, pondering. Um, we, we are still present and fighting and in Afghanistan and uh, we are still uh, attempting to uh, locate the spread of uh, al-Qaeda cells and affiliates, et cetera, uh, recently with a lot of emphasis uh, on Africa. These gentlemen 
know a lot about all of these topics. And uh, they're going to welcome your questions. And you may direct a question to one of them. And another may wish to enter in. Or I may think, well, having read their book, so-and-so needs to come. And we need to hear from him, too. So having said that, uh, I'd like to first introduce Miko Pelled and ask him to explain what, what brought you to write the book, what's the book about, who are you, what are your concerns. Take five or 10 minutes okay. and just talk to these folks. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I'm very pleased to be here today. Thank you all for coming and thank you everybody for hosting, for all the hosts of this uh, wonderful event. I think it's, uh, it's, it's great to see people coming in on such a beautiful day in Charlottesville uh, to, to listen and discuss the, all these very heavy, very important issues. Um, and I think it speaks to the fact that people realize, realize how important these issues are. What drove me to write the book is um, that I was made aware of the fact that I had a, an interesting story to tell. And when you live your own life, you don't think anything of it, but when you kind of step out of your environment and you start talking to people on the outside, um, you know, you start getting remarks from people. And um, at one point I was, I was urged by friends to sit down and, 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 and write the story. And the story is that I was born in Jerusalem, in Israel, uh, to a family that distinguished itself in its um, um, involvement with the establishment of the State of Israel. So my grandparents were early Zionists. Uh, my uh, maternal grandfather was a Zionist leader, signed the Declaration of Independence, the Israeli Declaration of Independence. Uh, my father fought in the War of 1948. Later on, he, he, he remained in the Israeli army when it became an army, when the state was established. And he ended up being a general and one of the group of generals who planned and led the War of 1967. Uh, which in Israeli terms, these, that generation of generals and officers were, were made into, almost made into gods um, because of all the victories that they were able to win. And they really established this state of Israel and its military force. Um, later on, my father actually, right as the Six Day War, this 1967 Six Day War was wrapping up, he stood up and he said, well, now we need to make peace with the Palestinians. And... Um, it was an interesting time because having conquered all that land after that war, there was a sense of, of almost uh, messianic fervor in Israel and around the world that you know the, the, the small Jewish state was able to do so much. Um, and here is this general who was one of the most forceful voices to begin the war of 1967, calling for compromise on the land with the Palestinians, whereas at that time Israel didn't even acknowledge there was such a thing as Palestinians. And, uh, of course, to this day, many people refer to them as plainly the Arabs of Israel. Um, and then from that point on, he, uh, he diverged from the mainstream. And for the rest of his life, he, he retired from the military a year later, and he dedicated his life to achieving peace, which he thought was the most important strategic objective of the state of Israel. And particularly peace with the Palestinians, because these are the people with whom we shared a land. And his concern was, and he expressed it at the time in 1967, that if Israel did not make peace with the Palestinians and allow them to establish their own state um, in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, that's when this idea began, began to be formulated, then <clears throat> excuse me, Israel will become an occupying power. The Palestinians will resist. The Israeli army will be used to fight the resistance. We'll have uh, political prisoners. And eventually, Israel will become a binational state. Now, mind you, he said this in 1967. Um, of course, as he was saying these words, the state of Israel went in a whole different direction and began massive campaign of building and uh, of building for Israeli Jews in the West Bank with an attempt to integrate the West Bank into Israel. Um, and this connects into the President of the United States just yesterday in Ramallah saying there's still a chance for this two-state solution, which when you look at the ground, you see there, I don't know where he gets that kind of, uh, how, he can, how he can say something like that. Um, because the evidence points, points the other direction. Um, my own go and, and the, what the book does, what I was able to do with the book, is talk about the politics, talk about the involvement of the state of Israel, and also talk about how my family was involved and how people came and went and how opinions changed and, um, uh, and paths diverged and, and, and merged uh, back and forth. Um, Two, year, two years after my father died, my father died in 1995. 
uh, and this was right at the height of the Oslo, it's the Oslo, the Oslo peace process, which was really the beginning of the, of the peace process with, with, between Israel and the Palestinians. And his very last article, the very last things he wrote and said was that Israel is not interested in peace. And his last article was, was titled uh, Requiem to Oslo. Because he read the Oslo Accords and he said this is not an attempt to bring peace, this is an attempt to bring the Palestinians to surrender. Israel is building settlements, obviously Israel is not interested in a two-state solution. Uh, and then he died. Um, and um, I think I'm not going to go into everything that took place between, between then and now in terms of the negotiations, but clearly they haven't worked, clearly they, they kept crashing and falling. Two years after my father passed away, uh, my sister's little girl was killed in a suicide attack in Jerusalem. Now this is always big news in Israel when there's an attack like that, but this was bigger news because of who he was, and she was the granddaughter of a famous general, and also the famous general who was Mr. Peace with Palestine. He pushed for peace with the Palestinians, and look what they've done. Um, and there are really no words to describe how powerful of, of, of the, the, the power of the emotions uh, when something like this takes place. Um, but my sister, uh, whose daughter was just killed, came out uh, and said a couple of very simple things that turned my, my perspective around and, and pushed me into a direction of activism. Um, and what she said was, she was asked about revenge and retaliation, the usual things that are brought up when, when something like this happens. And her remark was, look, no real mother would want to see any other mother go through this experience. So the idea that we kill more people in response to the death of somebody it seemed completely absurd to her, and she expressed it in that way. Um, and she used motherhood as this uniting force that really uh, unites us beyond any divisions. I came back to the United States, and you, it's, it's strange. How do you go? I mean, I was living in the U.S. already at the time, so I came back after the funeral, and you wonder, where, where do you go from here? What do you do with your life? Um, because you can't just go pretending nothing happened. And I was very fortunate in that I, was, I found a, a dialogue group, a Jewish-Palestinian dialogue group in San Diego, which is where I live. And for the first time, I was actually in a room sitting and meeting Palestinians and talking to Palestinians. Now, I was born and raised in Jerusalem, which is a mixed city, but it's a very segregated city. So as in Israel, you never meet Palestinians. Um, and so this was the first time I was sitting with Palestinians. And not only was it the first time I was sitting with Palestinians and talking, it was also the first time I was sitting with Palestinians. And we were completely equal. There were no laws that divided us. The laws that applied to me applied to them. They needed no checkpoints or to pass or, or, or permits or anything like that. And very gradually, they took me through a process of realizing, first of all, that there was another story, which I did not know. And that's where my journey, the, t the, the title of the book is The General Son and then The Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. The journey began at that moment where these Palestinians here in the US introduced me to a country called Palestine, which was right next door to where I grew up and to a people who were living right next door to me about which I knew nothing. Um, and their culture and their narrative and their stories and their pain and so forth. And uh, that was the beginning of the journey. The journey still goes on. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go right to the end of the book where, and you know, as you write a book, you, things evolve. The book never ends up the way you thought it would be um, when, you, when you work on it or when you begin to work on it. And that's, I think, a good thing. Um, and at the end of the book is a discussion between myself and my brother-in-law, the father of Smadar that, that, that was killed, and we're talking about the future. And this is an argument that he and I, or a discussion that he and I have been having since I was 12 years old, so we've known each other for a long time. And the gist of the discussion between us is, where do we go from here in terms of one-state solution, two-state solution, what are the possibilities? But that's really just the, the foundation for a bigger discussion. What is Zionism all about? What is the state of Israel all about? Uh, is it really a Jewish state? Is it, has it been good for the Jews as, as an experience? Uh, is there any way to justify what Israel does? And is, does, does it justify having a Jewish state? In other words, is this package a, a package that we accept? Because having a Jewish state in a country where half the population is not Jewish means you disenfranchise half the population, which means there's going to be resistance, there's going to, there are going to be thousands of political prisoners as Israel does have. There are going to be massive military attacks on civilians, which, Israel, which, which is something that takes place there. Um, and is this justified? Um, my personal conclusion is that it's not. Um, that um, it's far more important to have a real democracy with equal rights. We respect everyone's rights, everyone's civil rights and human rights within that country, call it Israel or call it Palestine or call it both. Uh, it's far more important 
to respect that and move forward as two people who share the land, Israelis and Palestinians who share the land, um, than to create this exclusive state for Jews only, knowing full well it comes with all this baggage of uh, violation of human rights and so on and so forth, just to maintain that one, you know, the, maintain the state as, as, as a Jewish state. Um, so so the, the, the book covers a lot in terms of time. It begins with my grandparents immigrating to Palestine in the early, um, in the early 20th century and ends with a discussion, a very current discussion that you know, could, is still taking place between two Israelis who are wondering where to go, how do we go from here. One of, a couple of things that I touched on that I was able to touch on as well is I went to the Israeli Army Archive, so I've got some information from there. I met with uh, Palestinians who, were, who sat in Israeli prisons for a long time, so you know, I've got um, a lot of interviews. So there's a lot of personal issue, stories there, as well as you know, the, kind of the, the overall issue of, of, of Israel and Palestine. Um, so that's, that's, that's great. It. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, our next uh, author, uh, Scott uh, uh, Etron, uh, wrote this book, Talking to the Enemy, Faith, Brotherhood, and the Unmaking of Terrorists. It's a very uh, ambitious, uh, far, far-ranging book. And uh, Scott, I invite you to talk about it. Thank you. Uh, the book is an attempt to bring together two different strains of my own thought. One is an abstract sort of intellectual ambition. The other is a very concrete one about how terrorist organizations work. I don't know if the book works, but I couldn't help myself in trying to bring them together. Uh, the first one deals with something called, I call it the privilege of absurdity, as Thomas Hobbes said, to which no living creature but man is subject. The fact that human beings are able to make their greatest exertions for the good or for the bad, to kill or to create, uh, not for their own kin, but for genetic strangers and for an abstract idea, an abstract cause, and we're the only creatures that do that. So I asked the question, how in evolutionary history did this come about? I try to provide some kind of answer in a sort of Darwinian framework, but then as an anthropologist, I was interested in what is the range of human behavior within this privilege of absurdity? I mean, where do we go from human rights to suicide attacks? And I wanted to understand behavior that was as different from my own behavior as possible. I try to do this in other spheres, like I have no musical talent, I have no botanical talent, so I write things about music or botany. Um, and so suicide bombing was something that was human and yet as different from me as possible, and I wanted to understand that. And I had been, I'm both French and American, and I had been the French sort of scientific attaché in Jerusalem in the 1980s during the first Intifada, and I was teaching at the Hebrew University, and I was also um, doing a mapping of Palestinian villages that had disappeared. And my assistants happened to be people uh, closely associated with the Muslim Brotherhood and the Hamas, which was just forming at the same at the time. Then I went to work in the Maya lowlands, setting up reserves for indigenous groups, and 9-11 happened, and I saw the celebrations all over the world, and the people in Palestine celebrating uh, 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 along with, with other people in favor of the attacks. And I saw that the administration was confusing the public in terms of who, in fact, was the enemy. Uh, and that the difference for me between, say, Al-Qaeda and Hamas was as great as one could imagine. So I wanted to write about what was happening, what was the genesis of suicide terrorism, for, to, to explain in my own mind. I wrote an article in Science Magazine, which is a sort of high-profile sci science magazine. It was very early after the attacks, and the response was, was pretty incredible. But then I wanted to go out in the field and try to figure out if what I had said was really true. So I spent the next nearly decade trekking with Mujahideen around the world, uh, from you know, the militants of the Jamaa Islamiyah to uh, the Hamas uh, to the you know, families and groups that had uh, sent bombers, suicide bombers to Iraq. Uh, to the people who uh, blew up the trains in Madrid, to the Hamburg guys, I mean, their neighbors and their friends. Try and understand the natural history of terrorism because law enforcement wasn't giving us any good idea. Law enforcement basically looks at who committed the act at the time they committed the act, how to prevent it, and how to punish them. 
But I was seeing a trajectory that took sometimes much more than a decade in terms of how these people got to the point they got to. And I found that the people who were actually involved um, were often almost arbitrarily involved at the particular moment the attack happened. It's like a game of, mu of, of musical chairs. There's a huge network out there of supporters, of people, of friends, of family, and whoever gets involved in the plot when the plot happens is an, sometimes almost in a random event. And I also found that the greatest predictor of who's involved in these plots uh, is who their friends are. And the easiest way to, to catch them if you have to catch them, is to find out what they eat and what they wear because they form a social network mostly of young people. I mean, things have changed since the heyday of Al-Qaeda. There's a trajectory. But again, it's a network of people, of friends and families who meet in action groups like soccer teams. For example, the, 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 the most deadly series of suicide attacks in Palestine, in Israel, was between January 2003 and June 2003, and it was one soccer team uh, from the Wadi Khatila neighborhood in Hebron. All of them wanted to go to the local uh, polytechnic uh, institute. The guys who did the Madrid bombing, they were also soccer buddies. In fact, it was, a, it was a sort of convergence of a group of sort of student ideologues and drug dealers from northern Morocco, all of whom grew up within 200 meters of one another from one barrio called the Jamal Mezouak. And the plot, when the plot happened, most of the ideological students fell away because they're not action guys, right? And they're afraid to blow themselves up. And the guys who actually blew themselves up when the police cornered them were, you know, five of the seven of them were these, you know, drug dealers uh, who wanted a cause. I mean, they don't want to be petty criminals. And this was a way, a sort of salvational, glorious way of finding meaning in life. And even Al-Qaeda, I find, although it's very different what happened in Iraq, for example, and what's happening in Afghanistan, but in terms of attacks against the West, Al-Qaeda is not a command and control organization, at least it wasn't after 2002. It was more like the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health. You applied to them, and they would accept 15 to 20 percent, something like that, of the, uh, of the propositions. Uh, applied to them, and they would fund, and they would help train in certain circumstances, but most of the people involved in the attacks were self-seekers, still today. They're mostly self-seekers who go out looking for Al-Qaeda, which is an attractor. Uh, and there's very, again, little command and control. There's very little sort of cell structure. There's nothing like brainwashing, which is a sort of myth from the Korean War. Again, it's mostly loosely organized um, self-seekers who bond and find a cause and seek glory. And glory is very, very important for especially young people, say between the ages of 18 and, and 30. By the way, most killing in the world since it began and in most murders in society are also that age group of young men. And so I started describing how these cells worked and I actually lived among some, some of these groups. And so I started getting interested in reporting it and it sort of caught the attention of some people in the White House. So I went to the National Security Council and I started telling them what I had found. Um, and the responses were very interesting, uh, especially uh, from, from Cheney, Dick Cheney's staff. <laughs> uh, it was, I remember one young woman as we're sitting there saying to me, well to the whole group, uh, don't these young people understand that when they behave this way we're going to have to kill them? We're going to have to bomb them. I said, I was sort of stunned, and I said, could you repeat that? And she repeated this very forcefully. And I said, who the hell are you going to bomb? You're going to bomb London? You're going to bomb Morocco? You're going to bomb Madrid? These are our allies. And how do you get into, how do you change these young people? So I, next in that meeting of the National Security Council staff, I handed out comic books of action heroes, the 99. 99 is an interesting uh, comic book series. It's developed by a PhD from Columbia, Kuwaiti, in political science. It's now a syndicated uh, TV show where they're making movies about it. And it's about the 99 variations of the of, uh, manifestations of Allah, of God. And there are young people who, don't, who come from different backgrounds, some poor, some rich, adventure stories, and they find a secret gemstone representing one of these 99 manifestations of God. And as they meet almost randomly at first, their, force, their, their strength and, and the force for good 
increases for UNICEF, for UNESCO, things like that. And I was, you know, thinking about how this appeals to young people. And so, and so I distribute these comic books. I said, this is going to be a lot better, something like this, than, say, your program, which is Moderate Islam. I said, you, some of you have children, right? When did your children, your teenage kids, ever respond to moderate anything? <laughs> So how do you get to these people? And I gave them this anecdote. So I was in the Jama Mezwak shortly after the Madrid bombings, where they, had, where they had also sent a whole bunch of people to, I mean, volunteer to go to Iraq and blow themselves up in Bakuba and elsewhere. And the kids are playing in soccer in the garbage. And I'm asking them what they want. And you know, surprisingly, eight-year-old kids, they want to be archaeologists. I asked them, why an archaeologist to get treasure? No. We're interested in our history. I'd like to find out what the history of our people is. Another kid who was 12 years old wanted to be a neurosurgeon. And these are poor kids in the neighborhood. The school where all the suicide bombers came to, from, the elementary school and the high school I went into, it's all Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and Goofy. There's no Quranic injunctions. Most of these young people have never studied the Quran. They're not religious. None ever went to madrasas. Uh, they're born again into this thing, again, sort of seeking glory and meaning. Uh, when they're 18, 19, 20 years old, and they find it with their friends. A few of them go off. And so I'm asking these kids, who are your heroes? First hero is Ronaldinho. He's the Barca striker for the Barcelona soccer team. By the way, the whole world outside the United States is basically divided into whether they're supporters of Real Madrid or Barcelona and a few Manchester United. Uh, the second was the Terminator as their hero. Uh, they had no idea he was related to the then governor of California. <laughs> and the third hero was Asma bin Laden. I went back a week after uh, Barack Obama was elected president, and I asked the same question to a different bunch of kids playing in the same neighborhood. Number one hero was Eto, who was a Cameroonian striker from the Barcelona soccer team. Number two was Terminator 2. And number four was Asma bin Laden. But number three, just beating him out, was Barack Obama. And so what's this telling us about these young people? They're at a fork in life, looking for heroes, looking for some meaning, looking for glory. And they can go this way to, you know, yes, we can. Or they can go this way to happiness is martyrdom, where people say, look what four people with box cutters did. They changed the world, and you can do that too. And the question is for, I think, our policymakers, which I found not to be answered either in the National Security Council or anywhere else, was, well, what do we do to make them go this way rather than that way? And just as a last point, I'll say I've been doing a lot of work with leaders as well. I, I spend a lot of time with uh, the leaders of the Hamas in Damascus before and now in Cairo and Israeli leaders, trying to figure out to what extent peace is possible. And what I find is that in intractable conflicts, what is important are values, sacred values, not utilitarian cost-benefit analyses. In fact, I think that's what got us out of our caves, and that's what makes the groups we have so enormously powerful, and what's what got genetic strangers to unite for one another and build things like nations. These are transcendental values, which, say, the framers of the Declaration of Independence also had. And I find that you cannot solve these conflicts, either for the leaders or the people, when you present it in terms of cost-benefit terms. And again, our, military, our mil own military, when they think of how to defeat these people, do think in pretty much utilitarian terms, make it too costly. So here's just one experiment, and then I'll, and we do this in Iran, by the way, too. One experiment, and then I'll leave you. So we went to uh, Mr. Netanyahu, and I said, so I'm, we're going to go see uh, Mr. Mashal in Damascus, the leader of the Hamas Palpier, do you have any questions for him? The only question he had was, I don't care about territory, borders, things like that, border. This is the only question I have for the Hamas. Would they ever recognize the right of the Jewish people to be here, to exist here? That's the only question. And then I asked Mr. Mashal what his response was. And his response was, hmm, we've been in jail for over 60 years. And now you want me to recognize the right of my jailer to be here. Let us have a jail and we'll talk. Of course, that wasn't the answer the Israelis were waiting for. And then I asked him, do you have a question? And he said, will the Israelis ever understand the harm they've caused us? 
Will they ever apologize for it? So then we went and we did these mass experiments among the people themselves where we presented trade-offs like, would you accept a peace along the 1967 borders in exchange for giving up the right of return? For example, among the Palestinians, the right to come back and resettle Israel. And for the Israelis, in fact, just a few days before they left Gaza, we asked the settlers, would you ever give up the right to greater Israel to settle the West Bank and Gaza in exchange for a permanent peace according to the 1967 borders? Both sides, almost ceiling, over 80% said no. And then when we offered material incentive, so many thousands of euros or dollars, depending, uh, if you would accept the peace deal, their anger increased. Their support for violence increased among the Palestinians for suicide bombing, among the settlers for resistance. But then when a non-material offer of purely symbolic value was made, for example, what if the Israelis apologized for the dislocation and dispossession of the Palestinians in 1948? And on the Palestinian side, we asked the Israelis, what if the Palestinians recognized the suffering the Jewish people had and why they came here? And we found that even among the leaders and the hardcore militants of both sides, support for violence went down significantly and willingness to talk went up significantly. But again, people don't want to treat that. A divorce lawyer once said to me, yeah, you know, if you ever started having people apologize, then we'd be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Uh, Commander Yusuf uh, Abu Lanayn has written Iraq in Turmoil, Historical Perspectives of Dr. Ali Alwardi from the Ottoman Empire to King Faisal. And the book is replete uh, with uh, pr uh, praise from his colleagues in the military, most of whom said at one point in one way or another, uh, wouldn't it have been wonderful if we had this book before we invaded uh, Iraq? I ask you to comment Thank on you, the sir. book. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for having us and, and, uh, and for sponsoring us. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm an active duty Navy commander and I, uh, uh, basically uh, work at the Joint Intelligence Task Force for Combating Terrorism in Washington, D.C. Basically, I basically analyze uh, violent Islamist groups. But, uh, and previous to that, I spent four years from 2002 to 2006 on the staff of uh, Office of Secretary of Defense for Policy. I was uh, Secretary Rumsfeld's uh, director for North Africa and Egypt and assistant director for Arabian Gulf Affairs. And any questions the secretary had on Islam, Islamist political theory, or militant Islamist ideology, I tried to provide a coherent answer, mind you. A coherent, not the answer, but a coherent answer. And if I couldn't find that coherent answer, I typically would consult uh, some of the other experts to help me answer the uh, secretary's questions. Uh, Iraq in Turmoil is my second book, and I didn't expect to publish a second book so quickly. My first book, Militant Islamist Ideology, came out in 2010. But ever since I was a lieutenant, I have been, even before 9-11, I have been a, a, an extreme advocate for trying to teach our U.S. combat forces using direct Arabic sources. And it all began really in the early 90s when uh, Egyptian generals began to publish their memoirs on the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I said, wouldn't it be great to at least in, offer that perspective to uh, US military readers? So I began to write for the United States Army, for infantry and for military review. And that began my writing career, if you will, in the active duty military. And Iraq in turmoil occurred because what was happening was, is all of a sudden uh, soldiers in the field were telling me that there's this book that everybody's talking about by Dr. Ali Alwardi. Have you read it? Well, no. So I go to the Library of Congress Middle East Reading Room, and I ask the, the uh, chief librarian of the Middle East Collections, says, do you have the book on Dr. Ali Alwardi? And it's called Social Glimpses of Modern Iraqi History. And um, I was expecting one book, ladies and gentlemen. He comes back with eight volumes. So I, I crack open the eight volumes, and I realize why it is so important to Iraqis. Dr. Ali Alwardi is considered the father of Iraqi sociology. Now keep in mind, this man gets his PhD at the University of Texas and then goes on 
in the 1950s to establish his reputation as the father of Iraqi sociology. We Americans, there are certain books you gotta have in your quarter, right? To understand the American character. Surely you would agree with me. For the Iraqis, it's al wardis eight volumes. He, his eight volumes begin with the arrival of the Ottomans in the early part of the 16th century. And then it takes you all the way through to the founding of the Iraqi nation state. It, it begins with, it talks about how different Ottoman governors managed various tribes. How did those tribes settle in what is now Iraq? Where did they come from originally? What are their tribal ties? How did the Ottomans manage those tribes? How did they manage the Shiites? How did they manage the Kurds? Sound familiar? D different Ottoman governors. Some, who were successful? Who was not successful? Who was remembered for their cruelty? Who was remembered for putting in a hospital or a school and bringing some semblance of order in what is now today uh, Iraq? It talks about how the British handled the same issues, for instance. It goes on and on. The book then goes on to talk about the importance of, for instance, the Shia Hausa. So let me give you kind of a, an understanding because I believe, I teach at the Nash Defense University part-time and I bring to my classroom direct Arabic sources because what I'm trying to teach our senior officers is the human terrain of the Middle East, the human terrain of the region, to empathize, not sympathize, to empathize with the region, put themselves in their shoes, understand their history. It's not about whether the history is accurate or not. It's their history is what I'm trying to teach to our uh, men and women in uniform uh, in places like the National Defense University. So let me share this kind of story with you. Basically, uh, about the Shia Hausa, you have Grand Ayatollah uh, Ali Shirazi. He is equivalent to what is now, who, to Ali Sistani. But now the year is 1890. It's during what is known as the Persian Tobacco Revolts. What happens is the Qajar Shah in Persia gives away the entire tobacco concession of Persia. I mean, we're talking growing to packaging to a British firm for 15,000 pounds. Is that a good deal? What do you think? Is that a good deal? Now, of course, it, Persians see that as totally unfair, totally a bad deal. So they appeal not to clerics in Qum, they appeal to Shirazi in Najaf, which shows you the importance of the influence and the ties between the two countries. They appeal to him, and what does he do? He issues a fatwa, a religious opinion. And, he, and what happens is, is all of a sudden clerics, both in Persia and Iraq, enforce a non-smoking ban, where people boycott, it becomes known now as the Tanback Revolt, after the package of cigarettes called Tanback. You see, the Tanback Revolt. Now, you have clerics enforcing that ban, but looking the other way while people are smoking opium, right? And other things, but enforcing that ban. It gets so bad that the Qajar Shah goes into his harem and he notices who's not smoking? His own wives, you see. He appeals to Shirazi, and Shirazi basically says, I'll rescind it. He, he refuses bribes, he refuses gifts, and finally, uh, he, the Shah is forced to rescind this agreement he had with this British firm. Now, of course, he would be levied with a massive indemnity for breaking the contract. Same guy. Now it's 1905. And the question is, in, again, comes from Persia, but reverberates into Najaf. Should we have a constitution? Because now it's the 1905 constitution, very first one in Persia. Should we have a constitution? So what does Shirazi do? Of course, he's Shiite, and you have to understand something very, very important. With 1.5 billion Muslims, there is no common agreement on what constitutes Islamic law or Islamic regulations. It's in the human condition. So basically, Shirazi, being a Shiite, begins to deduce, and he says, all right, there is nothing in the Quran or the Hadith these are sayings of Prophet Muhammad and the Book of Divine Revelation by Muslims that ordains how Muslims are to govern themselves. Okay. What the Quran does have is, for instance, shura, that's consultation, adl, that's justice, and wali al-amr, someone who's a head guy 
who is, oversees the whole structure. How you choose the head guy, how do you establish justice, how do you establish consultation, that's left completely to the individuals involved, those institutions. You can't find that in any kind of religious documents. So Shirazi makes the argument and issues again a fatwa saying all constitutions are is a mechanism to enable shura, consultation. And he coins the Arabic phrase for constitutionalism, mashrutiya, from shura, you see. That's what you get by reading Al-Wardi's work. So all of a sudden, as you read his work, you realize that these towns, these villages, these rivers, the, the ground means something to the Iraqis. It's not just objective Kansas, objective x-ray, some nameless place on a map, on a grid square. You know, this, it's where ancestors are buried. It's where previous battles were fought. Talking about Syria, I have a chapter in there about Syria. During the uh, uh, 1920 uh, revolt, uh, it's a f most defining aspect of Iraqi nationalism. You have a situation where uh, you have fighters trickling in to revolt from Syria. Well, what happened during Operation Iraqi Freedom? Same thing, right? And it's amazing, too. It's the same villages, but almost 80 years ago, you see. That's what really immersing your mind in the human terrain, and with empathy, mind you, allows you to uncover, allows you to understand. So what's the 1920 revolt about? Well, Wardi devotes two of his eight volumes to that defining event. In essence, World War I ends, okay? It is decided after the Sykes-Picot Agreement, I'm being very, I'm gonna be being very, very abbreviated because you can write books just on that agreement. Um, basically, the areas of British, French, and Tsarist Russian, of course, Tsarist Russia doesn't exist anymore, spheres of influence, but mainly British and French of influence, begin to harden into these mandates. Mandates. What does mandate mean? That actually does mean something. In other words, you would have a mandatory power to oversee the eventual independence of that country. So how do you think people that fought the Arab Revolt felt about that when they figured out there were going to be a mandated power? So what, you, what do you have? You get the 1919 revolt in Egypt. You get the 1920 revolt in Iraq. And it takes time. It takes effort to subdue that revolt because you have Shiites, Sunnis, and Kurds unifying against this revolt. At the end of the day, force alone doesn't work. They have to basically engineer a plebiscite creating the monarchy of Prince Faisal, member of Lawrence of Arabia, the David Lee movie played by Sherlock Guinness. Well, he becomes King Faisal the first. Engineer that plebiscite in order to bring pe uh, relative peace to the region, you see. These are the complexities and the nuances that are so important. Now, uh, initially, I found it a tragedy that al Wardi's work wasn't widely circulated among our, amongst our US combat forces. So what I did was I buckled down and I uh, basically distilled his eight volumes into a series of 11, I didn't know at the time, 11 essays. And uh, I published those essays in the US Army Armor Journal. So I'm sitting at my desk at the Pentagon and all of a sudden I'm getting these phone calls. I'm Staff Sergeant so-and-so calling from Fallujah. I'm first sergeant, I'm first lieutenant so-and-so calling from Ramadi. Are you the guy writing that stuff in armor? And I said, yes, I am. He says, when's the next one coming out? I said, well, it's a quarterly, so. He says, we're using this to train our forces on the human terrain. I was like, that's awesome. That's exactly why I wrote this. You know, it's better than medals, my God. This is, this is what I'm talking about. This was a good commuting day for me in the D.C. area <laughs> when I got that phone call. So when the 11 essays came out, the uh, uh, same calls. Is Armour going to publish an edition just collecting it all. So it could just make it easy for us to teach our soldiers the human terrain and Marines and sailors uh, uh, the human terrain. I discussed it with Fort Knox. Fort Marmor used to be published by Fort, used to be published at Fort Knox at the time. I, they, we discussed it. I, I discussed it also with my f publisher of my first book, Naval Institute Press. And Naval Institute Press said, hey, we've got it from here. And they negotiated with Armour and Army and the 11 essays became 11 chapters. Iraq in turmoil, 
that you, just Yusuf, if I, if I yeah. could use that as a concluding point, I think Absolutely. That, that would be great. Uh, they're also my publisher. I wrote a book on Iraq myself. Excellent. So Excellent. it's Thank uh, you. it's a great Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It, it it's 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 a great study and it's it's a great education and a great effort on your part. Uh, I know that some of you are really familiar with terminology uh, and concepts that have been advanced, and some of you are swimming <laughs> and wondering, well, what is that, and where is that, and so on and so forth. But I think all of you probably have uh, seen that this is a, a panel that is. Uh, comprises uh, an interest area and a level of expertise that's really special. So I, I think, let's give them all a hand and then have, <laughs> let, let, let's have some questions from you. Uh, there'll be a microphone. Please uh, speak into the microphone, this gentleman right here. Uh, second, the thank you, terrific remarks from everybody. Uh, my name is David Swanson. I haven't met Miko Pellet, but he's been on my radio show. I cannot recommend his book highly enough. I haven't read the other two yet, I'm sorry to say. I have a question for Scott Atan. Is that the last name, if I have it right? Um, there, was a, there was a study very recently of families living underneath the buzzing of drones in Pakistan and the incredible trauma, another name for which might be terror. And it seems to me if you asked refugee families living in camps having fled our violence in Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, how do you stop the terrorism? They wouldn't say, let's go study Muslims. They would go, let's go study Americans. And I wonder if it would be appropriate for anthropologists to study what motivates the greatest purveyor of violence and terrorism in the world. You know, what, would that be appropriate? Should that be done? What would it take? You, you discussed what it would take to get Israelis and Palestinians to talk to each other. What would it take to get the gentleman to your left or the gentleman to your right to denounce U.S. militarism? What would bring about that kind of change? Scott, uh, you've been asked a question. Please speak into the microphone. Well, what, 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 what I think would, would do that? I think the first thing that would be needed would be a restructuring of the National Security Council. This sounds like a weird recommendation, but remember the National Security Council determines American foreign policy. Unlike our domestic policy, which is informed by all sorts of human factors, the composition of the National Security Council is such that the only real input is from the intelligence agencies, the defense agencies, the Council of Economic Advisors, USAID has a seat there but really can't say anything. And so there's no real input about human beings for human beings' sake. And so while our social tissue, our fabric of our society is built for the rapid integration of diverse points of view in immigrants, for example, where, for example, Muslims achieve parity with the rest of the American population within a generation, while in Europe they're seven to 19 times more likely to be poor after three generations, and we're very well structured to absorb all sorts of points of views and to have relative social peace. In our foreign policy, we're not structured at all to really understand the world. I mean, compared, for example, even to the British colonial system, uh, it's fairly pathetic. So I think the first thing would be to, to revamp the way we actually carry out foreign policy and think about the world, and not just in terms of our economic and military strategies. And then uh, engage people. Uh, I've, I'm always stunned. You know, he, I'll just give you an example. So I'm up in Kashmir, Azad Kashmir, Pakistani Kashmir, uh, right after the earthquake. And Americans are coming in with Apache helicopters. And some American soldiers are there. And of course, they look like Martians, right? They have this gear and their full metal jacket. And I'm asking the people there, you know, meanwhile, the Mujahideen, Lashkar Taibi and Lashkar Jangvi and all of them are in Pakistani military half tracks with loudspeakers saying this is all the fault of turning away from Islam trying to recruit people at the same time. So you have this weird situation with American Apaches coming in with food and, and aid and these guys running around, actually some in, in their half tracks collecting some of this stuff. And so I'm asking the guys, you know, the people on the ground, what do you think about that? And they look up and they say, yeah, it's a good thing. But I say, so what really strikes you about the aid that's coming in? And 
every one of them tells me stories about Cubans. You say, Cubans? The Cubans had sent in 3,000 doctors into Azad Kashmir, into every nook and cranny of Kashmir, setting up field hospitals, no propaganda. I mean, when the USAID packages came in, they were parachuted in, this is the contribution of the American people, blah, 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 and then there were sort of things about freedom and liberty. But the, 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 the Cubans came in low-key, set up field hospitals everywhere, and stayed till May when they were finally kicked out. And everybody in Azad Kashmir, nobody there wants either the Pakistanis or the Indians, basically they want their own independence, loved the Cubans. And so I went to the chief naval, I was in a meeting with the chief naval officer, and uh, at this meeting they, they're talking about, you know, what kinds of things could change America's standing in the world. Why do Muslims hate us? And I said, there are two things. That anecdote, and he said, God, we'd love to do that, but can you imagine doctors in this town volunteering to go up into Azad Kashmir? Actually, there probably would be very many doctors who'd be willing to do it. And the second was the tsunami in uh, Aceh. In, in, I, was, I happened to be there as well, and on TV you would see American soldiers carrying kids on their back and just being nice guys. And a Pew poll had showed that the Indonesian support for American foreign policy, and especially counterterrorism efforts, had plummeted to less than 7%. After they saw this on television, it went up to over 50%, that they realized they themselves had a terrorist problem. And they, for the first time, they saw Americans doing something for nothing. That is, not asking for something in return immediately. And that did more to change Indonesia. It was short-lived, it wasn't followed up, but it did more to change Indonesian opinion than all of the military effort and the propaganda we used. So those are just two anecdotes I think we're- We have another hearing. question here, sir, in the second row in the middle. Uh, thank you. I want to thank you, uh, Miko Pellet, for your talk last night. I learned so much from you. And I went back I was a little dubious about your last thing about eventually there's going to be a whole different one country in Israel, Palestine. I went back to my room and on the TV I saw President Obama, who I'm not a great favor, I'm not a great uh, impressed by him by his foreign policy. But uh, but he had he was talking to a big group, mostly students. Uh, Israelis, and he had said he had met with a group of Palestinian students and asked them what they would want for their future. And he told this, these, this audience there, he said they said that they want to have more education and a better life and all of this. He said, I'm sure if I had asked you that question, that would be the same answer that you would give. They want exactly what you want. He got a standing ovation. So I said, well, maybe there's a lot more interest and push for justice for Palestinians in Israel than there is in the U.S. I don't know what you think about that. Um, well, I, I don't know that, <clears throat> I mean, first of all, thanks for your comments and thanks for coming last night and, and all that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know that that would be a good gauge of public opinion because of the enthusiasm and the excitement and the president being there and so forth. I would, I would argue that a better uh, gauge of Israeli public opinion would be the results of the last Israeli elections. Um, and if they've shown us anything, it's that Israelis could care less about the Palestinians, one way or the other. And this is a result of the fact that Israel has created a very segregated country that allows it to function and believe that it is a Jewish state and it has the legitimacy that it needs to be a Jewish state there. Because like I said, growing up in Jerusalem, I never met Palestinians. So I was perfectly happy in my part of Jerusalem thinking that this is Israel and everything's fine. And then uh, the other part, the other part of that equation is, is, is an education system, an Israeli education system that creates the impression on the Israeli side that Palestinians are, exist only as a problem or a threat, um, but not as people. And we heard a lot about how important it is, the human, you know, the human relation, the human connection is. And I think, and I would argue that by design, a reality was created where Israelis do not see Palestinians as humans. 
Um, so I wish I could share your optimism just, just from that. Um, but I think um, um, the notion that I prescribe to, and, and I'm not the only one, of course, uh, that the best solution for the Israeli-Palestinian issue is a democracy with equal rights, because there's really no other choice, and it's also the better choice for everybody, I think. Um, I, I don't think there's going to be a lot of support for it in Israel right now. I think it's going to be something that Israelis are going to have to wake up to one morning and realize that it's, it's happened. I think, um, you know, if we compare it to whites in South Africa when apartheid fell, I, you know, I doubt that most whites in South Africa at the time would have supported apartheid falling, but there you are, they had to deal with it, you know, or here in the South, in the U.S. Um, so again, I wish I could, I, I could share that optimism. I don't think, though, that Israelis, and, and, and you know, plus, there's, like I said, the elections and polling and so on, demonstrates that there is um, a real shift in the other direction among Israeli youth. And again, like I said, the Israeli elections have, 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 the Israelis have spoken, so you know what they're thinking. Let's have another question. Who, ma'am, here in the. Um, I'm an American. Jew, and I have been to Israel, and you're an Israeli, but I have seen it so much differently. For example, how about the fact that at the time when, this, when the UN declared the state of Israel, they wanted to have a partition, and it was to be broken up equally between Jews and Palestinians, and the result was an attack on the state. So that's one question I'd like you to answer, Miko Pellet or anybody else who can. The other is, Israel has given in. How about Gaza? Gaza. What about ha what happened there? It was an opportunity to show peace and growth, but instead, they're still <coughs> lobbying the rockets into Israel. So, and the third thing I want to mention from what I've read in the papers, I know there's a growing group like yourself who are sympathetic to the Palestinians, and many of them, there are, there's an, a Palestinian population in Israel. So why is it always one-sided that Israel is the one that has to give and the Palestinians will not? The, and as you mentioned, Recognizing the state is the absolute first step. How else can there ever be a discussion? Thank you, ma'am. Well, thank you. Those are excellent questions. And I would say that um, the book covers each and every one of those. But I'll, I'll be brief and, and, and answer them as well. But um, <laughs> get the book and read it. I think, I think you'll find, you'll find, you'll f oh, you have it. OK, good. Um, but, but I will, I'll, I'll reply briefly um, as best I can. So first of all, the, the, I brought, the issue of the partition is very interesting, actually. The, the United Nations on the 29th of November, 1947, decided, you know, came up with a partition plan. Um, and I don't know if you know, if you've seen the map, but just the map, the way the map itself looks is, is enough to scare anybody. Um, I always think, well, how do they think anybody was actually go on the ground and mark the boundaries? It was such an absurd map. But beside that, they did not divide it equally. Um, because at that time, this is late 1947, you had less than half a million Jews. Most of them were immigrants and the children of immigrants in Palestine. This is the generation of my grandparents and my parents. You had a native population of close to a million and a half Palestinian Arabs who are the native of Palestine. Yet the United Nations gave the larger portion in the partition plan, the larger portion was given to the small community of immigrant Jews and the smaller portion to the Palestinians. Even if it was divided equally, the Palestinians would still be justified in rejecting it. Because why would anybody accept that a small group of immigrants and their, and their children be given a large portion of somebody else's homeland? Well, how can you possibly sell an idea like that? How would anybody re accept an idea like this? And what's interesting is that even to this day, people blame the Palestinians for the conflict because they rejected the partition. Would anybody here not have rejected it if they were in their shoes? I doubt it. 
every single person sitting in this room today would have rejected that plan if they were the Palestinians. Now, the story that we hear, and obviously you've read, and that I grew up with, is that immediately after what they call the Arabs rejected the plan, because they didn't call them Palestinians, the Zionists called them the Arabs. The Arabs rejected the plan. The Arabs began a massive assault to destroy this fledgling state, this new Jewish community. But when we look at the two communities, we see that they were both hoping to become states. Everybody knows that. They had institutions of state. But there was one thing that the Zionist community had, the Jewish community had, that the Arab Palestinians never did, and that's a fighting force. The Zionist militia by that time numbered close to 40,000 armed, trained men. My father was an officer in that militia. And they were very well indoctrinated. They were true believers. They were true zealots to the cause of creation, creating a Jewish state in Palestine. There was no equivalent on the Palestinian side. In fact, Palestinians have never had an army. There was no equivalent on the Palestinian side. So who are these Arabs that attacked? We know that other, Arabs, other Arab uh, armies uh, you know, it, it got involved in the conflict, but that was much later on. So who are these Arabs that attacked? There were no Arabs that attacked. As soon as this, as soon as the United Nations resolution to partition was accepted, the Israeli, the Jewish militia, the Zionist militia began a 12-month attack, assault, that included terrorizing and ethnic cleansing of a, civil, of a civilian unarmed population of Palestine. How else could they have accomplished everything they accomplished in 12 months? They conquered 80% of the land almost, they displaced close to a million people, and they destroyed hundreds and hundreds of towns and cities. They did this in 12 months while they were being attacked by somebody else? That is not possible. But again, when we look at the two communities, we understand how this was possible. Some people may agree that it was the right thing to do, some not. But we cannot argue about the, the, the reality that the Zionist militia engaged in a 12-month terrorized attack, terrorist attack against the Palestinian population in order to establish the Jewish state. Now, you jumped from that all the way to Gaza, I think. So I'll, 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 I'll follow your, I'll follow your uh, thing, because this is, I'll, I'll, you know, but a lot has happened in between. When Israel, what's called, gave, what people like to say Israel gave Gaza back, Israel gave Gaza to no one, Ariel Sharon decided on a unilateral move to pull out the settlers from Gaza. There were seven or 8,000, I believe, settlers in Gaza. Unilaterally, without negotiating, without agreeing with anyone, he pulled out the settlers. Then Israel placed Gaza under a siege. So Gaza is not a state. To have a state, you have to have an economy. You have to have travel, commerce. You have to have life. People in Gaza don't know if their house is going to be blown up tomorrow for absolutely no reason. So you have a population of close to 2 million people. And the only reason there's only malnutrition among children in Gaza and not starvation is because of a series of 1,500 tunnels that have been dug on that boundary, very narrow boundary of seven kilometers between Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula and Egypt. Because the, 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 Israel has, the Israeli Navy blocks the water, Israel has built a barrier, and Israel does not allow people to travel, it does not allow goods. Gaza are under siege. Now, is it a realistic expectation that people will live under a siege like that, close to 2 million people, which means, you know, typically I think 52% of the population are children. So you do the math, how many children live there? That a population lives under a siege like that, on a regular basis, periodically, suffering massive assaults by the Israeli military. Not from today, in fact, the assaults began in the early 50s, but on a regular basis and periodically, the Israeli military goes into Gaza to, ex to, to, to cause as, much civilian, as many civilian casualties as possible as a policy. So that these people who live under these conditions would not respond in some sort of violence, in some sort of, of, of an armed resistance, as ineffective as it may be, as ineffective as it always has been. But I think that that expectation is really not realistic. Now, the impression that was created particularly from the, the you know, 1994, 1995, when the Oslo peace process was, was, was taking place, and then strengthened around the year 2000 at the Camp David, when, when President Clinton tried to bring the parties to Camp David and close the deal, the impression that was created was that the Palestinians 
are not willing to make concessions. The problem this conflict is, 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 is prolonged is because the Palestinians are not willing to make concessions. Now, in the early 1970s, early mid-1970s, my father was involved in this group with other Israelis who were pushing for this notion of the two-state solution. So the Palestinians, so Israel would allow the Palestinians to establish their own state in the West Bank and Gaza. Throughout the 70s, the Israeli government ignored it. In the 80s, the Israeli Knesset passed a law making those contacts, those meetings, illegal. Suddenly, in 1993, Israel began the Oslo Peace Accords. And you have to wonder what happened in 1993. By 1993, the West Bank was fully integrated into Israel. There was no way to establish a Palestinian state anymore, which is why they were willing to negotiate with Arafat, but not for peace, for surrender, which is why it failed. In the year 2000, after days and days and days of negotiating at Camp David, the parties came out, and I'll never forget this, President Clinton said, well, the Palestinians gave some, but the Israelis gave more. And from that point on, once again, Arafat was, you know, he became the demon of the day because he was not willing to make concessions. Take a look at the map. Mika, let me, let me interrupt because we're okay. going right. to run out of time, and I, I would like someone here to ask a question about Iraq. <laughs> if you don't, I will. But, sir, you interested in asking a question about Iraq? Actually, I think I'm asking a question about us, about the United States. Okay, well, the commander can answer but any But relative questions. to Iraq, okay, you, you felt like you needed to read eight volumes to, to begin to understand, I presume. Not, you, don't, you don't feel like you have a complete understanding oh, of course not. at this no. point. And what time. I like about El Wardy's title, he calls it Social Glimpses. So even he recognizes that his eight volumes is a glimpse. It, it, just, it just whets your appetite for more, you see. But please. But so now you, your, your appetite is whetted, mm -hmm. okay? We live in a culture in this country today where if you look around in this room, almost all of us have gray hair. And we love books. Wisdom. But we're a minority today. We want to be, our, be wetted. And the vast majority of our kids want to live in 144 characters tweeting. How are we ever going to begin to understand the complexity of Israel, Palestine, of uh, Persia and Iraq, just that part of it, to all of the great um, human history of all time, if we continue to minimize discussion to yes we can or something like that. And, and that's what strikes me is that as a culture to begin to understand whether the US military is, is the great force for terror, I would argue with that, but if we continually make it tiny, how, how, do, how do we begin that but process? Let's give the thinking? commander an opportunity to respond. And yeah. that, that'll be our last uh, <laughs> sure. word. I think it's extremely important to understand something, and that is uh, it really depends on the subculture that you're dealing with. Um, I've been privileged enough to at least be among uh, young men and women uh, who are active duty and in the reserves who, who hunger for an understanding of the area of operation. And, and, but again, let's be very clear here, less than 1%, less than 1% serve in the United States military or have family in the United States military. But that, be that as it may, I'm at least steeped in uh, young men and women who are hunger for that because that is their, gonna be their tactical area of operation. I also, on the other end, also advise at the strategic level. And, and when you talk about strategic level, you're talking about not solving problems per se, but managing the problem, managing the problem. Because every time you solve a problem tactically, at the strategic level, it becomes another opportunity and another challenge. I, w what's important to realize is um, we, we have to, first of all, inculcate a kind of a, an, an, an interest in the, re in the region, and also an interest in the use of how we consume information as Americans. Like for instance, one of the, in my opinions, one of the downsides of technology, of the internet, is you can have certain biases. We're all human beings, we all have biases. We're all human beings. You can have a bias, right? 
But instead of recognizing you've got that bias, which, by the way, is totally worthless if you're in the intelligence business or in the policy-making business. These biases can actually be quite harmful, as you've seen. Uh, but you can actually live in that bias, go on the internet and find things to reinforce that bias, or live just on a diet of a few channels, you see, just to reinforce that bias that you already have, you know. So it's almost like we have to almost educate how to consume news, how to consume information in the 21st century. Like in my case, uh, I, um, I, if you ever come to my office, I, I typically have on background, uh, as far as background noise, um, of course CNN, Fox, of course, and then of course a, a myriad of Arabic channels, you see. So when someone asks me, Where, what, where's the Arab outrage? Where's the Muslim outrage? I can say, well, you know, starting in at late 2005, I can actually answer that question because I began to see it in late 2005 in the Arab media, in Al Arabiya TV, for instance. Now, the Al Arabiya TV, for instance, is owned by the Saudis. But what do you see? You see them using Wahhabism. Again, it's a form of fundamentalist Salafi, a form of Salafism. I'm, I personally, from my, my, as a personal choice, it's not my form of expression, but using Wahhabism to deconstruct Al-Qaeda ideology, you see. So, but that requires a, almost teaching. A lot of my time, too, is spent teaching uh, uh, members of the Defense Department and members of, of uh, the military how to consume and how to be critically, how to critically analyze critical analysis. So it's not just spurking curiosity. I mean, get, curious mind is good. And when I hire, for instance, someone or in the process of picking someone to be in this kind of business of counterterrorism, first thing I ask is not the piece of paper. Did you, get your, did you go to UVA? Did you go to Harvard? Did you go to Yale? What's your GPA? No. What I'm looking for is are you the kind of person, man or, man or woman, who gets up in the morning saying, what am I going to learn today that I didn't understand yesterday? That constant curiosity. That's the spark. See, give me someone like that. And then I can train you how to consume information critically, you see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, please fill this out uh, for the benefit of the festival staff. Everybody should have a copy, give an evaluation. Terrific panel. Uh, now, the authors are available to sell you a book, talk to you, sign a book. I've read them all. They're really superb books and they're worth your time. Thank you.